without our involvement, changes happen without our consent. Black communities in Canada have been marginalized and undervalued by the planning and design of cities. From the racist policies of urban renewal in the 1950s to the gentrification of cities throughout the 21st century, anti-Black racism is a force that is deeply rooted in North America. Unfortunately, Black Canadians have a long history of being excluded from urban planning decisions based on these false assumptions and stereotypes. There is an absence and lack of Black businesses and organizations and leadership in the rooms that make decisions around our land use planning policies. Why don't we see <laughs> Black ethnic enclaves? Why don't we see Black services? Why don't we see Black people everywhere? This has led to the unequal distribution and management of resources, including affordable housing, public transit, and food security. As a result, Black communities have been left without adequate access to services and opportunities. We look at what happened with Africville, where people were forced out of their homes so that infrastructure could be built. The same thing in Hogan's Alley in Vancouver. These were cases where people specifically used city building as a way to kind of destroy and undermine Black communities that had been established for generations in cities. And the impacts of anti-Black racism are still being felt today, with the ongoing gentrification of historically Black neighborhoods, the displacement of Black residents and businesses, and the uprooting of Black communities throughout the country. This lack of permanence often leaves Black communities feeling disconnected from the city and their neighborhoods. Many times, urban planning, urban renewal, has really been kind of almost like an ethnic cleansing of Black communities, of Black neighborhoods. They have been taken apart from their schools, from their casual acquaintances, in their neighborhood, and they have become poorer for it. So how can we fix this? Cheryl Case of CP Planning has the right approach. Through bottom-up learning, with an emphasis on engagement and empowerment, we can protect our Black communities in Canada by listening to their needs and providing them with the necessary tools and resources to implement their own solutions. Black-led nonprofits have been practicing care for these communities for decades, and if you want to lift up the Black community, you have to enable them to be their own leaders. When we invest in our community, we can see that it actually belongs to us and can't be taken away. And we still see a reflection of ourselves in the future. The ways in which we build our cities haven't always led to the most equitable outcomes, and in some cases, has caused certain groups of people more harm than good. So when I think of anti-Black racism in uh, communities in Canada, I think of how planning as a profession um, and a process have used kind of the spatial mechanisms for control and power to shape our natural environment. It's embedded within the methodologies uh, within the policies, within the assumptions and the ideas around it. So it's been embedded for so long that it's it's been normalized. And in many ways, there are things that aren't questioned. But I think that's led people to to get this sense that, you know, whatever we're doing must be the right thing because it's so, you know, formalized and, and, uh, and certified and regulated. And, you know, the ethics are woven throughout everything that we do. But I think there's a failure there to interrogate the history that is the planning practice. And when we examine the ways historical thinkers and leaders made decisions about how our cities would grow, we can see that the enrichment and fulfillment of Black lives in cities simply weren't priorities. In many cases, racist and discriminatory views and perspectives led to the neglect and disappearance of Black communities throughout Canada through the intentional and systemic use of planning policy. We can understand this as anti-Black racism. And the idea historically has been um, these mechanisms have been used to generate, uh, to enhance health, safety, quality of life for residents. But when you look at it a little deeper, you start to see that the distributions of benefits and, and just how growth and change show up haven't been equitable. Uh, not equitable in the sense that uh, our Black communities in particular have experienced disproportionately negative outcomes. And that's also kind of related to or a product of 
the institutionalized inequity. When you look at where the focus of you know investments, where the capital investments or infrastructure, where they are, it really tells you the historic story of marginalization, that these communities were never, it was never intended that they would survive as long as they did, that would thrive, that they would thrive in the way that they did. And they did. Throughout Canada's history, our planning policies and institutions have been established and utilized in ways that ensure these communities do not thrive. And Black Canadians have had to navigate these discriminatory systems, often with little support, making it that much harder to flourish. Within the Western European model of formalized planning, again, the point was never to have us there. <laughs> people of African descent, people who were stolen from the African continent, weren't even supposed to move into an understanding of what it meant to be human uh, within legal definitions. And so when we think of, of humanness, and not, and not to get into the philosophy of this, but that is connected to citizenship. And so if a population of people um, are essentially tied um, as a permanent underclass, uh, and not even necessarily a laboring class because there wasn't an exchange for the labor conducted. Um, it was stolen labor. Then what you have is a, is a perpetual class of people and population who are fighting for civil rights from the beginning of the formation of what Canada is. And that's really what we saw with the Black population. Not only can we observe the historical lack of acknowledgement or care in ensuring that Black people thrived in Canada, but we can also examine how our governments use planning systems and policy decisions to intentionally destroy and diminish Black communities. There's more to it. You know, these things happened over time. They happened in boardrooms. They happened, you know, deliberately and intentionally and systematically and systemically. These were purposeful decisions that were made um, often uh, within city halls. These were political decisions um, and bureaucratic decisions as well. In order to justify their removal and destruction, Black communities were portrayed as dilapidated, blighted, unsafe, and eyesores in the city. Similar to other cities, there was a level of just specific attack, uh, whether it was ensuring garbage pickups weren't happening, just that level of ensuring that a community that is often tied to some level of class discrimination and race discrimination appears derelict and appears mismanaged. And oftentimes, again, that, that comes down to city decisions. Africville on the outskirts of Halifax was a black community dating back to 1848. For decades, the city of Halifax refused to provide residents clean drinking water. By 1970, the city had relocated all of Africville's residents. Some of them were moved in garbage trucks. This made it very easy to convince a voting class that these areas needed to be raised, redeveloped, and recovered for the highest and best use. Typically involving economic goals in which black communities were seen as a hindrance. As such, methods of redevelopment, under the guise of urban renewal, were implemented that sparked both the symbolic and literal demolition of many prominent black communities in Canada. That history and that story needs to be told because there's an ongoing narrative, unfortunately, of these communities being, you know, uh, communities in, in need of help, communities in need of being fixed and that type of an idea. So the idea that these community needs to be fixed is inherently problematic. Instead, these communities need to be supported. You know, the equity work needs to happen. A lot of these decisions were considered best practices. And that's just the reality. It's as a planner, I see it today where we very much still will use language around best practice and reviewing what another jurisdiction is, is doing. And if it on the surface seems to have worked for them, we incorporate it or we import it <laughs> as an innovation. And these were innovations as well. And urban renewal was the standard of the day. It was the standard for CMHC, uh, which was a part of this. It was the standard for edu engineering departments. It was considered good rationale, uh, engineering and planning practice. And so that's how it was able to, to happen. Despite these being seen as best practices based on expert opinion, 
and intended to provide benefit to cities, the impacts of these decisions tell a different story for community. And this has led to understandable contentions over how helpful or well-intended these planning decisions really were. But that's just how the system operates, right? It pathologizes, it makes these places need fixing, need intervention. And most times the intervention is one to just, you know, entirely just decapitate or to cut away and, and, and just remove entirely these communities. And the blame falls squarely on the communities instead of the government for the lack of the services, for the, for the, gener for the transgenerational disservice that happens. These things are a product of their time, yes, but there's no reason why we cannot review them, redevelop them, rework them to be more culturally appropriate, more responsive to the interests, needs, and priorities of the communities today. Thank you.